Welcome to Newsday. I'm Sharon Jeet Lale in Singapore, the headline. I'm Kasia Madeira in London, also in this programme. From our studios in Singapore and London. This is BBC World News. It's Newsday. Well, good morning. It's 8 a.m. in Singapore, midnight in London, and 2 in the morning in northwestern Syria, where Turkish forces are carrying out a major military operation. Ankara says it's targeting Kurdish fighters who control territory along the Turkish border in Syria's Afrin province. But that risks putting Turkey on a collision course with its NATO ally, the U.S., which has been backing the Kurdish forces as they took on the group calling itself Islamic State. However, the Turkish government sees the Kurdish groups as terrorists with links to militants inside Turkey. Well, our correspondent Mark Lowen sent this report from the Turkish side of the border. The UN Security Council is meeting about this on Monday and we'll hear from our correspondent from the BBC's Turkish service about that, so stay with us. But now let's bring you up to date with some of the day's other news stories. In Washington, it's been an unusually busy weekend for the Senate, which is still trying to strike a deal to end the US government shutdown. The failure to reach agreement on Friday meant that much of the federal government was shut down. Both sides have been blaming each other. Sunday's debate is still going on, but this this is how the Republicans and Democrats laid out their arguments at the start of the session. Well, that debate could continue for several more hours. We are hearing from the White House that President Trump has had several phone calls and that he is working hard to end the deadlock. And one Republican senator has said that he's hopeful that there will be a vote on Sunday evening on a stopgap bill. Of course, we'll keep you up to date on any developments from Washington the moment they happen. Also making news today, a delegation of North Korean officials is visiting South Korea. Now, Afghan officials say the number of people killed when a group of militants launched an attack on the Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul has risen to 18. All the gunmen also died, but it took the security forces several hours to bring the situation under control. From Kabul, Zia Sharia reports. Well, let's return to our main story, Turkey's military operation against Kurdish-held territory in northwestern Syria. Enis Sanadam is from the BBC's Turkish service. And that was the BBC's Enis Sanadam from the Turkish service speaking to Kasha a little earlier. Well, you've been watching a Newsday on the BBC. Stay with us because still on the programme, Chris. Welcome back to Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. And I'm Kesha Madeira in London. Our top stories this hour. Turkey says its forces have entered a Kurdish-controlled enclave in northern Syria. President Erdogan says that he hopes the incursion will be brief. And U.S. senators are trying to reach an agreement to end the deadlock over the budget, which has led to the federal government being shut down. And these pictures of a dramatic rescue from a mountain in Scotland are proving popular on BBC.com. They show the moment when a Coast Guard helicopter finally reached two climbers who'd been stranded overnight in sub-zero temperatures. They got into difficulties when a blizzard swept across them but were eventually hauled to safety alive and well. Well, let's take a look now at some of the front pages from around the world. We can start with the Japan Times, which focuses on the displays of unity between the two Koreas in the upcoming Pyeongchang uh, Winter Olympics. Now, the paper says some South Koreans believe their government went too far with a so-called political show and see the lull in tensions as meaningless amid the Olympic euphoria. Now, the uh, China Daily reveals that uh, China is to begin the process of selecting the next generation of astronauts. It says uh, the new recruits will train to work on the country's planned space station, which is due to become fully operational in four years. Now, we're having some problems taking a look at the papers, but I can certainly continue to tell you about them. The uh, South China Morning Post, uh, certainly, it carries a uh, headline on its front page. It says, Corridor of Pain. It shows a uh, picture of just some of the 62,000 uh, runners who took part in the Hong Kong Marathon just uh, you know, hours before daybreak yesterday. Uh, 32 of them, the paper reveals, ended up in hospital where they were treated for the effects of pollution. 
Well, let's uh, bring you up to date with some of the papers. But uh, Kasia, a rather unusual comment by the Pope has sparked lots of uh, discussion online. Oh, it absolutely has, uh, Sharon Jeet, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. It's Pope Francis. He has spent, I tell you what, I've got your papers here, actually. That's probably why they, you were having problems there in Singapore. The papers are here. But let me tell you more about the Pope, because as you'll know, he's been traveling in Latin America, and uh, he was in Chile. He then went to Peru. On his final day in Peru, he got into a little bit of trouble because he told nuns to avoid gossiping. Hear this. He was speaking to a gathering of nuns in Lima when he gave them this advice. Oh, now, apparently, the Pope was telling them that they shouldn't be gossiping, and he uh, uh, said something about terrorism as well, which actually the, the nuns were very respectful of his advice. But I have to tell you, not everyone in the audience, or in Peru for that matter, were happy about his words. Not everyone was happy at all. Uh, they weren't impressed. Pope Francis also mentioned what he called the terrorists of Ayacucho. Now, they were involved in an uprising in which nearly 70,000 people died or went missing at the end of the last century. And a number of Peruvians have taken to social media to criticize the comments by the Pope as insensitive, and they'd called them also disrespectful to the dead. There's much more on our website about that, but I can tell you that uh, the Pope has now left Peru and he will be going back to the Vatican in Italy, no doubt, in Rome. So, yeah, a little bit of trouble there. But now, Sharon Jade, back to you, because I know you've got uh, more about, uh, you've got a guest in the studio, I believe. Tell us more. That's right, really exciting and I'm looking forward to interviewing her because we know that science and technology uh, are really areas where traditionally men have dominated, but one woman has certainly made her mark on those fields. Two years ago, Dr. Frances Arnold became the first woman to m win the prestigious Millennium Technology Prize, often considered the Nobel Prize for technology. Well, she pioneered a method known as uh, directed evolution, which is a, a sped up version of natural selection in the lab. And of course, she joins me now. She's here in Singapore and in our studio. Welcome to the program, Dr. Arnold. Now, first off, your, your prize winning discovery really involved uh, something called uh, mutating DNA to direct evolution. Now, it sounds a really hard concept for most of us uh, watching uh, on the show to understand. So could you explain to us a little bit about how it affects us in everyday life? I, I hope it's not such a hard concept because humans have been using biology for thousands of years to solve problems and manipulating them at the level of DNA and their characteristics all that time by selective breeding of everything from poodles to racehorses, flowers. So what we can do now is use those same ideas, but at the level of molecules. I, I direct the evolution of things called enzymes, which you would be surprised how many we use in our daily lives, starting with things like laundry detergents. Mm. Enzymes improve the characteristics, make it easier to take stains off clothes. And we use enzymes for everything from making pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. materials, textiles, mm -hmm. blue jeans, you name it, many, many more. Right. My methods can be used like selective breeding, mm -hmm. but to make better enzymes, because we really don't understand all the details of how they function, but mm -hmm. we can breed them just like we can breed a poodle. Fascinating. Now, of course, you're in the STEM industry. This is the sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics. This is an area that, of course, traditionally women don't seem as attracted to. And yet your background is a chemical engineer. So tell us how important is it to have women in this industry, perhaps to make it more innovative? It's such an exciting time for the whole biotechnology industry. And women bring a perspective of wanting to care for the planet and of, of having, not using up all our resources while we have a good life. Women have half the most creative minds on the planet, so we can't solve these really deep problems without bringing women in. And I think this is such a great opportunity mm -hmm. for women to use their creativity and capability to solve these really huge global problems. Right, and indeed, as you have done in the science field. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time today, Dr. Francis Arnold.
An inspirational woman and an inspirational interview. Well, I can tell you now that a second day of women's marches is underway around the world, many protesting against President Trump on the anniversary of his inauguration. There were events in London and Paris, but perhaps the biggest gathering was in Las Vegas in the U.S. Virginia Vardinathan was there. So, yes, uh, marches all over the world. Thanks for watching Newsday. Bye-bye for now. weather and the upcoming weekday weather here's over to the weather team live from our studios in Singapore and London this is BBC World News it's Newsday Good morning, it's 9 a.m. here in Singapore, 1 a.m. in London and 5.30 in the morning in Kabul, where Afghan officials say the number of people killed when a group of militants launched an attack on the Intercontinental Hotel has risen to 18. All of the gunmen also died, but it took the security forces several hours to bring the situation under control. From Kabul, Zia Shahreya reports. Let's take a look at some of the day's other news stories. And in Washington, it's been an unusually busy weekend for the Senate, which is still trying to strike a deal to end the U.S. government shutdown. Their failure to reach an agreement on Friday meant that much of the federal government was shut down. Well, both sides have blamed the other. Sunday's debate is still going on, but this is how the Republicans and Democrats laid out their arguments at the start of the session. Well, that debate could continue for several more hours. We're hearing from the White House, actually, that President Trump has had several phone calls and is working hard to end the deadlock, of course. Any developments at all from Washington, we will bring them to you as they happen. Also making news today, Germany's Social Democrats have voted to open coalition. Now, if you like chocolate and you like shoes, you need these in your life. These are high heels really made from edible chocolate. I'm not joking. They're just some of the many creations on show at a festival in Rimini in Italy. You can also pick up apparently edible Vikings, something more fruit based or even a solid chocolate bag. Not very practical, but wouldn't it be lovely to find out if they taste as good as they look. And North Korean officials have been inspecting Winter Olympic venues in South Korea. Is the first such trip by a delegation from the North since uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in took office last May. Sophia Tran-Thompson sent this uh, report, which does have some flash photography. Turkey is facing international calls for restraint after it launched a ground offensive against Kurdish militia in Syria that has been a key Western ally in the fight against the Islamic State group. The United States urged Turkey to avoid civilian casualties and to ensure that its operation against the YPG remained limited in duration and in scope. Well, France has demanded an immediate ceasefire and called for an emergency debate at the UN Security Council on Monday. Mark Lowen reports. Welcome back to Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. And I'm Kasia Madeira in London. Our top... Well, let's take a look now at some of the front pages from around the world. We can start with the Japan Times, which focuses on uh, displays of unity between the two Koreas in the upcoming Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Now, the paper says some South Koreans believe their government went a little too far with a so-called political show and see the lull intentions as uh, meaningless uh, amid the Olympic euphoria. Now, the China Daily reveals that China is beginning uh, the process of selecting the next generation of astronauts. It says the new recruits will train to work on the country's uh, planned space station, which is due to become fully operational in four years. And finally, the South China Morning Post carries a uh, somewhat cheery headline on its front page uh, called the, uh, the Corridor of Pain. It shows a, a picture of just some of the 62,000 runners who took part in the Hong Kong Marathon just before daybreak yesterday. Now, 32 of them, the paper reveals, actually ended up in hospital where they were treated for the effects of pollution. 
Well, that brings you uh, up to date with some of the papers. Uh, Kasia, uh, a rather unusual comment by the Pope seems to have sparked a lot of discussion online. Oh, Sharon, you're absolutely right. Pope Francis, he's since left Peru, but on his final day there during his uh, tour of Latin America, he told nuns to avoid gossip. Now, he was speaking to a gathering of nuns in Lima when he gave this bit of advice. Nuns were receptive, but not everyone in Peru was impressed. Pope Francis also mentioned what he called the terrorists of Ayacucho who were involved in an uprising in which nearly 70,000 people died or went missing at the end of the last century. A number of Peruvians have taken to social media to criticize these comments as insensitive and disrespectful to the dead. The Pope has now left Peru. He's on his way back to Rome, but yes, he spent his last day in Peru saying that. Much more on that story on our website. Now, two years ago, Dr. Frances Arnold became the first woman to win the prestigious Millennium Technology Prize, which is often considered the Nobel Prize for technology. Now, she pioneered a method known uh, as directed evolution, which is really a, a sped up version of natural selection in the lab. Now, she's here in Singapore uh, attending the Global uh, Young Scientists Summit, and she came into our studio earlier. I put it to her that her work was uh, at the limits of what non-scientists can understand.